First John chapter two this morning, first John chapter two, as we continue to work our way through uh, this powerful little book written straight to us as God's children. We're looking this morning at the title, Family Secrets. Family Secrets will be in this for uh, this week and next week as well. First John chapter two, we're looking at verses 12 through 14. I'll read the text, we'll pray. And we'll get into it this morning. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse number 12 and going through verse 14. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the infallible, inspired word of God that we study every Sunday morning. We're thankful for this text this morning, which will draw us closer to you, which will help us to see uh, the love that you have for all of us and the love that we need to have for you and for uh, one another as a family of believers. We're thankful for the Apostle John. And in his uh, high age now, he is writing this marvelous little book. And it has been a, a help and a blessing to countless generations down through the centuries. Uh, may it enliven our hearts this morning as we see you on the pages of Scripture. To see your heart that you have for us, your love for us. We ask that you might uh, help us to see the truth that we need to personally get here this morning and to exemplify in our life and to make whatever adjustments, changes, commitments that we need to be making in our lives today. Help us to do that. Uh, we pray that in this, in this time in our life right now and in this world that, uh, uh, that you might reignite our hearts for you, uh, that you might revive us again. And uh, we ask for that revival to happen all across our land. We need that desperately. And we ask that you will do that. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me now for the message this morning. Uh, we would see Jesus high and lifted up. We want to be more like you. We want to be able to express in our lives those things. We want to be like Christ, just like the Lord Jesus, and help us in this. Uh, may it be our quest uh, may it be our goal in every moment of every day to be more and more like you. We ask all of this in the blessed and holy name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. It's interesting that a lot of Sundays I will get things and uh, I just want to share something I got this morning from uh, Pastor Matt Jury, who used to pastor down in York Springs and uh, is, is living in Virginia now, his, uh, where his wife is on our prayer sheet, Lee Jury. We pray for her. She has uh, metastatic breast cancer. He sends out a little uh, prayer for pastors every Sunday morning, still doing it, even though he's been gone from uh, York Springs for years now. And I, I just thought, you know what? Here we are studying uh, 1 John, and he sends one that this fits. It's so good. And what it is, it's a, a little prayer uh, by uh, a man named Peter Marshall, who lived uh, 1902 to 1949. Did not have a, a long life, but uh, this prayer indicates that he was what 1 John calls a father uh, in the faith. He says, I ask not merely to love those easy to love. Help me to love those who are hard to live with. Give me a concern for the needs of others, not on the basis of barter or exchange, not love given for love received, but love given to the unlovely for Christ's sake. Then shall my love partake of thine, 
who dares to own me still. In the name of him who is the king of love, amen. I said, man, that was good. That fits what we're looking at here in 1 John this morning. Well, as we begin this next text of verses 12 to 14, a preacher who had pastored for more than 50 years was fond of calling just about everybody, even men in their 60s, the term lad. Now, we know that John calls us and called those that he cared for children or little children. And the reason that he did that is because John was very old. He was, he was either in his 80s or his 90s when he writes this. He was way up there. He was a real senior citizen. And we have already seen that John always referred to everyone in the church as children or little children. That was the designation. It is a term of endearment to describe every single believer that was under his leadership. And of course, that extends here to all of us today. Uh, we know that the Apostle John pastored the church at Ephesus for a while. So he had real pastoral experience. So here he is now, upper 80s, even 90s, and he's writing. Uh, not many people were older than him at that time. Uh, there are those in our congregation that can say the same thing. There are not many people that are older than me. So he refers to all believers as children or little children. All believers. The term in Greek expresses the love that John had for the whole church, for everybody that he oversaw. And John uses three descriptive terms for the people to whom he is writing. And we want to look at that this morning. He uses the word children. He uses the words young men. And he uses the term fathers. Now with those three terms in mind, and he uses each of them two times, let us go back and read those three verses again with that thought in mind and notice those words as we come to them. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. So he has three designations, three terms that he used. So we want to see what is John doing here? What is John up to in these verses? He is dividing the church up according to their spiritual age, not their numerical age. Age. So as we look at these verses, throw out how old you are numerically in this life. That's not what he's getting at. It's going to be all about where are we on the spiritual level of the Christian life. That's what he is going to be getting at here with these three designations. Actually, what John is doing is using a one size fits all title, regardless of of age. There is a metaphorical twofold division of the believers in the church. Those who have been Christians for a long, long time and are spiritually mature are the fathers. Those who have been Christians for a shorter length of time, doesn't matter how old they are, 
because people get saved at all different ages. So those who have been Christians for a shorter length of time are the young men that he is talking about. There's an inclusive group, and the inclusive group is the little children or children. All of us here this morning are in that inclusive group. So I want us to see these terms and what they mean. All believers are in the inclusive group, little children. So the inclusive group of little children, which is all of us, John breaks into two groups. So he takes us all and he breaks us into two groups. First of all, we have young men. They are the believers, men, women, children, who are younger in the faith. In other words, pretty much spiritual novices, no matter what the age is. The, the designation of fathers refers to the more spiritually mature. Now notice carefully that young men and fathers are never used by John for the entire inclusive group of little children. Spiritually speaking, God's people are at different levels of spiritual maturity. And Jesus, in his teaching, referred to two kinds. He referred to the lambs, and he referred to the sheep. The Apostle Paul talked a lot about the weaker brothers. John's designation fits this paradigm specifically. Spiritual maturity is a process that often has little to do with physical age. Now, when I walked the halls of Bible college, you would notice that there was a great difference of spiritual levels of maturity within the student body of four years age difference. You had the students that were kind of carefree, didn't care a whole lot, slept in chapel every day, didn't get involved in anything. Uh, and then you had those who were after everything they could get spiritually. They were hungry. Those that would take notes in the chapel service. They would go to the society prayer meetings. They would go on extension. They would be involved in ministry. And they would lap up everything spiritual they could get. That's the difference. So within a four-year range, you had many who were very spiritually immature, and you had those who were growing like crazy who you would designate as the fathers. So there are two kinds of spiritual infants mentioned in the New Testament. Number one, Christians that have been recently saved. They are spiritual infants. They've not been saved for very long. And just like a brand new, newborn baby, they need the same kinds of things to grow. They need to have food. They need to have the pure milk of the word of God. They need to have the love of the church. They need the atmosphere of the local church. They need to have that in their life. They need to go there. And they need to be around those that are more spiritually mature and can help them. Now, when you think of little children, I'm not talking about the spiritual little children. I'm talking about now the real little children in life. All right, the little ones, the toddlers and so forth. Little children are ruled by their emotions, not their understanding. All moms and dads know that. They easily get excited. They easily get frightened. They easily get distracted. New Christians need the fellowship and care of the mature believers in the church to help them to grow spiritually. And then the second kind of spiritual infant mentioned in the New Testament are the carnal Christians carnal. Now, a carnal Christian is someone who may have been saved for many, many years, 
and uh, for some time, but they're stunted in their spiritual growth. They're, they're just not growing. They're, they kind of reach this level, and they're just kind of happy to coast on that level, and they're not interested in any more growth. They just, all right, I'm good. I know a lot about the Christian life. You know, I participate in this, that, but, you know, I kind of don't need to do a whole lot more. And so they're carnal. And so this is an interesting statement. I didn't make it up, but it's good. The maternity wing is never intended to be a rest home. The maternity wing is never intended to be a rest home. A nurse rocking a 40-year-old man with a bottle in his mouth is a pitiful picture. It should never be seen in the local church. We need to be growers. We need to be growing, 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 taking off in our, in our faith. Now, all that brings us to our first point that we'll look at today. Point number one, John writes because our sins are forgiven. Are forgiven, and there's more to that. And that comes from verse number 12. I write unto you, little children, everybody in the church, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Literally, in the Greek, John is saying this, your sins have been forgiven. That's the way you need to read this. Your sins have been forgiven. Forgive, forgiven. This is the perfect tense that is used here, and it conveys the notion that your sins have been once and for all forgiven and will never be brought up before God again. You see, this is doctrine that we need to have in our minds and our hearts, because we're going to meet a lot of people who don't think that and don't believe that. And what they are not believing is what John is saying here in his epistle of 1 John. So the perfect tense, your sins have been forgiven. It conveys the notion that your sins have been once and for all forgiven and will never be brought up before God again. This is listed by John first because forgiveness is the fundamental experience of the Christian life and the condition of fellowship with God. Forgiveness of our sins is the one thing all the little children have in common. All of us have that in common. Our sins have been forgiven, never to be brought up again. Forgiveness is a big deal in the gospel and in the preaching of the church history time in the book of Acts. So I'm going to turn there to Acts and look at five different verses where we see this. Forgiveness is a big deal in the gospel. I'm going to start with Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Acts 2, 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we have the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins. And then we turn to Acts chapter 5 and verse number 31. Acts 5, 31, he keeps, he keeps preaching this, the forgiveness, forgiveness. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And then we turn to chapter 10, verse 43, Acts chapter 10 
verse 43. Acts 10, 43, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins, will receive pardon, will receive forgiveness. And then we go to Acts chapter 13. It just keeps coming up as the book goes along. Acts chapter 13 Verse number 38, Acts 13, 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And then we go to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Verse number 18, Acts chapter 26 and verse number 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Notice this is uh, in, in red. These are the words of our Savior. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. It is by faith in Jesus Christ. So forgiveness is a big deal in the gospel preaching in the book of of Acts. Now John wants to encourage his readers. So he adds a little phrase at the end of this verse, for his name's sake. For his name's sake. Their sins were forgiven because of what Jesus had done on the cross of Calvary. We are forgiven on the basis of who he is and what he has done, Jesus our Savior. John is telling you, dear believer, here at Faith Chapel this morning, that your slate is clean. And it will always remain clean because Jesus died in your place. We have a clean slate. Our sins have been forgiven. This is the concept of forensic forgiveness. Forensic forgiveness simply means that when you trust Christ as your Savior, God through Christ forgives you of your sin based on the atonement that Jesus Christ made on the cross of Calvary. We want to make sure that we understand the difference between forensic forgiveness and what is called filial forgiveness. So forensic forgiveness is we have a clean slate. All of our sins have been forgiven. They are gone. When we sin as a Christian and we still sin, we all know that, what do we do? We break our fellowship with God, but we are still in the family. Again, doctrine we need to know and understand because there are those that don't believe that. All right? So when we sin as a Christian, we break fellowship with God, but we are still in the family. We are not kicked out of the family. We do not lose our salvation because we have sinned. Our fellowship with God can be broken, but we do not lose our salvation. When we practice 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we practice 1 John 1, 9, confessing our sins, 
the forgiveness that we receive is a filial kind of forgiveness that restores our fellowship with God. Okay, do you see the difference between forensic and filial? Forensic forgiveness is we have been forgiven clean slates all the time. But since we sin, still sin because we're still in this sinful earth, we do sin and that breaks fellowship. So we confess our sin and then we are restored to perfect fellowship with God. That is filial restoration and forgiveness. So when we practice 1 John 1, 9, confessing our sins, the forgiveness we receive is a filial kind of forgiveness that restores fellowship. But our forensic forgiveness remains intact throughout. All right? So when you, uh, this afternoon, we're all perfect right now. Nobody's sinning right now, right? <laughs> but let's say this afternoon we go and we do something dumb. We say something dumb. We think something dumb, something wrong. And uh, our forensic uh, forgiveness is intact. We have been forgiven of all of our sins, but our sin has broken fellowship, and so we need to fix that. So to fix that, we confess our sin, and we are restored to fellowship. That's fil uh, filial uh, restoration and forgiveness. When John says that your sins have been forgiven, he is referring to forensic forgiveness. Now, verse 12 ends with an important phrase, for his name's sake. God has forgiven our sins for his name's sake. And that will pop up in the Psalms as well. My sins are not forgiven for my sake. No, they are forgiven for his sake sake. I haven't done anything to deserve it. It is all because of what Christ has done and earned for me. Aren't we blessed? Here's the point. God's forgiveness of our sin must forever be detached from our merit from our good works, from our being a good Christian, all of that. God's forgiveness of our sin must be detached from our merit. This is the problem that a lot of unbelievers have when they think that they're going to go to heaven because they have done enough good things that they will be... How they get this, I don't know. It's, it's, it's from the pit of hell. No, no. We are unworthy, filthy, rotten sinners, and it's by God's grace and his mercy that we sit here saved this morning. So our forgiveness must be detached from anything we do, any merit that we may think we have. We, we saved sinners are forgiven for his name's sake. My sins, however massive, however filthy, were not too much for the great God of mercy to pardon. No sin is beyond the forgiveness of God. Whenever I think about people thinking they're beyond, I think of the guy at the car show yelling back and forth, I've done too many wicked things to be saved. So he wrote himself off. Lie from the pit of hell. He needs to read 1 John. He needs to be taught 1 John. No sin is beyond the forgiveness of God. The disease of sin appears to be fatal. I am a hopeless case. Yet the great physician heals on the basis of his shed blood on the cross of Calvary and glorifies himself in the process. There's a human interest story that goes with what we're looking at here this morning. 
It matters greatly in whose name I am forgiven if I am really forgiven. Public scandals of public figures have become almost commonplace. I shouldn't say almost, they are. You baseball fans of old will know this story maybe. Wade Boggs was a five-time American League batting champion during his career. With a lifetime batting average of .356 and a 2005 Baseball Hall of Fame inductee. At the height of his career, for four years, Boggs had a mistress traveling companion, Margot Adams. When news of the scandal broke, the affair had already ended. Boggs had already confessed to his wife. Shortly afterwards, in a Barbara Walters interview with Boggs and his wife, Walters asked him, what went wrong? Was it the glitz and glitter of fame and fortune? Was it the wicked other woman? Boggs sitting quietly before the camera and holding his wife's hand said no to all the above. In so many words, he said, he did it because I am a sinner. That's why he did it, because he was a sinner. Walters seemed incredulous, meaning unwilling or unable to believe. She turned to Mrs. Boggs and asked, and you actually forgave him? Quietly, Mrs. Boggs answered, yes. Barbara Walters' facial expression indicated that the clue phone was ringing, but no one was home to answer. She simply didn't seem to get it. I forgive you are three of the most powerful words in any language. I forgive you. That Mrs. Boggs is a great woman. I don't think there are all that many that would have said, I forgive you for that. They are powerful words in any language. When God himself speaks those words to you, they are based on the work of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. Which we'll be looking at the nitty gritty of his death on the cross tonight. It is for the sake of his name that we are forgiven. His name is the forsake of his name. A man was asked to make a donation to a charity in his father's name. His first thought was, well, I'll make a small donation, but then he thought further, if I'm going to do this in my father's name, I must give as he would give. I must give as much as I can. You know, that's what Jesus did. That is what he did. He gave the greatest sacrificial gift ever so that you and I could be saved today. Now, we need to take this truth to heart of what Jesus did so that we can have everlasting life. Our love, our service, our devotion should be in that light. We could adapt a famous line from Luke 12, 48 and say it like this. To whom much has been forgiven, much is required. That is us this morning. Much is required because we have been forgiven. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have looked at some deep truth here this morning. 
of the love of God. The love that you had and have and will have for us. The love of Jesus to be obedient to the cross. To go through what he went through to bear away our sins so that today our sins have been forgiven. We have a clean slate all the time. Father, may we moment to moment make sure that our fellowship is restored, that we are forgiven by our great Father because of those things that we still commit along the way. May our fellowship with you be great every day. May it always be restored when it is broken. Help us to do that. Help us to live for you. Help us to take John's words to our hearts this morning and live them in these days. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.